We are going to start now the first uh, round table on maritime security. And the panel is moderated by, by uh, Marianne Perondoise, a research fellow at the Institute for Strategic Research at Military School, IRSEM in Paris. Marianne, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Christine, for giving me the, the floor. Excellences, uh, distinguished audience and dear colleague, uh, good morning. Um, I'm very, very happy and particularly honored uh, to have the opportunity uh, and thanks to IHASEC to chair this first of all um, of uh, our today workshop. And this first of all uh, is dedicated to maritime security. And it's a topic that has been uh, abundantly referred to, mentioned uh, in the Indo-Pacific strategy, both of France and EU. Uh, and uh, it's uh, thematics that have been at the center of this forum and event organized not only in Paris, but also in, in Brest uh, during the, the framework of the uh, EU uh, um, of the French EU uh, presidency. And the fact is, uh, we all know uh, how um, the law of the sea, good order at sea, freedom of navigation uh, matters in the Indo Pacific. And to explore uh, more in depth this uh, topic, this thematic, uh, I have. Um, uh, four distinguished panelists uh, with me, uh, even uh, digitally. Uh, and we will try to give more perspective and resonance, both from the region, but also from the uh, EU uh, on, uh, on this topic. Uh, and we will finish, by the way, uh, with uh, Admiral uh, Ray uh, recorded, uh, recorded message. Uh, so, in, in order of, of, of our speaking, we will have Dr. Jilong Canberra, a research fellow at the Center for Strategic and International Studies uh, in uh, Jakarta, where its research field is quite linked to maritime uh, issue. Uh, I will turn after to Dr. Vijay Sakucha from the Kalinga International Foundation in Delhi. Jai is a very well um, known and very old acquaintance. He regularly participated in high level conference and is, has worked in, uh, worked in uh, very extensively on the thematic of the blue economy, maritime security, Indian Ocean uh, governance. Our third speaker uh, will be Professor Tom Yoshizaki from the National Institute of Defense Studies, NITS, based in, in Tokyo very well known in Paris because he contributes regularly to French strategic review. Um, we will have to listen to François Xavier Bonnet, a very active researcher, associate of uh, IRASEC. And then we will uh, listen to uh, the recorded presentation of the Rear Admiral uh, Jean Mathuré, uh, currently commander uh, of French Armed Forces in uh, uh, French Polynesia, Tahiti, and commanding General Joint Force. Pacific, Al Pasi. So um, I will kindly ask my uh, um, panelists to try to stick as much as possible to a 10 minute intervention. Uh, also, I understand we may have some flexibility. Uh, and I'm truly uh, convinced that uh, the contribution and input will be uh, very stimulating for, uh, for the, the, the audience. I'm now just turning to uh, my first uh, panelist, and uh, I will ask uh, Dr. Um, um, sorry, uh, Dr. Jilong Gambera if uh, he is connected and he, if, if he is ready uh, to take the floor and uh, to make the first presentation of my panel. Yes. Hi. Hi. Good afternoon. Glad to see you. Okay, uh, it's my audio connected. Uh, my internet is just suddenly uh, went down, but I, I hope I'm audible enough for everyone to hear. Uh, so yes, good afternoon. Sawadika, uh, bonjour and selamat siang to everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizer, Irasek, for inviting me to this webinar today. And uh, let me tell you, I'm very honored to be among distinguished participants and esteemed colleagues and also speakers. 
uh, and also both new and also uh, old friends here uh, today. Just a brief introduction of myself. My name is Gilang Kambara. I am a researcher here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, uh, where I, I talk among uh, one of the things that I focus will be on maritime issues. And for this afternoon, I'll talk a little bit about how Indonesia navigates its maritime security in this ever increasing multipolar world. So to kick things off, uh, perhaps I'll give a brief introduction of how Indonesia within its geographical, unique geographical position, straddling between the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean is faced on a daily basis or on, on, with an abundance of maritime security issues that we sometimes coin, you know, a global maritime, maritime security issues. Um, and even though that traditionally speaking, our day-to-day -day maritime security issues revolve around uh, illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing and other illegal extraction of maritime resources. Along the year, Indonesia has been and is susceptible to a myriad of other maritime security issues that are somewhat strategic in nature, which have caused which have caused a lot of geopolitical impact uh, in the past couple of years. And chief among these maritime issues, including uh, in here with my list, uh, slavery issues, such as the one that we uncovered in Benjina, where about almost up to 4,000 individuals are thought to be enslaved. Uh, of course, the well-known South China Sea dispute and its subsequent great power rivalry. Uh, the incident um, such as ship to ship transfer uh, of oil, such as the one that we experienced with empty horse an Iranian uh, flag vessel and empty Freya, a Panamian, Panama, Panamian flag vessel within Indonesian territorial waters that are uh, brought a lot of controversy. And uh, a, a well known maritime security incident involving the MV Weiss Honest, a North Korean flag vessel which were caught uh, false flagging within Indonesia's territorial waters carrying both North Korean flag and uh, if I'm not mistaken, an African nation flag. The latter one, the MV Weiss Honest, somewhat highlights the uh, Indonesia's uh, legis legislative practice that sometimes could undermine its full compliance with the United Nations Security Council, especially on the issue of um, North Korea's uh, sanctions. And this is where I would like to segue uh, myself to the topic of how Indonesia practiced its uh, maritime policy uh, as a non-aligned country uh, yeah, in, in this multipolar world. One thing that we need to note is that as a, as a country, Indonesia, Indonesia's maritime policy is somewhat geared towards a, a free and active policy, so something that's geared towards its, its foreign policy. We don't set itself, or Indonesia doesn't set itself behind the agenda of any world powers and have sometimes, as I mentioned earlier, uh, have you know struggled to try to find or at least follow uh, certain areas of uh, the rules-based order. For example, uh, such elements of UNSC resolution, some, not all. Uh, the North Korean issues I highlight with MV White Horse is something that is a very controversial issue that, that have been uh, flagged and also been reviewed every, now and time again within the uh, relevant authorities. And uh, just to show as well, aside from the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, Indonesia as a state has opted out from most maritime security regimes, uh, which are mainly from our perspective, our US led initiatives. So let me just share you a quick, presentation, just a one slide here, where um, in its attempt, and uh, excuse me, yeah, I hope you can see the screen. Not, not yet, oh yes, okay, yes. thanks. So between all 10 ASEAN member states, it's very uh, interesting to see that Indonesia is the one state that does not ratify all the maritime security regimes that are linked towards with the US uh, uh, linked initiative. Uh, the issue is because Indonesia, for example, with the uh, suppression of unlawful act as SUA, is that it deemed to give legal foundations for external parties to pursue and arrest vessels in Indonesian jurisdiction. And there was rejection with the uh, Container Security Initiative or CSI was under the consideration that the initiative is intrusive 
And finally, with the PSI, it, it, it sees that it gives precedent, precedent for other countries to be involved in any form of interdiction of ships within Indonesia's EZ. So this is a very something that I'd like to highlight among the uh, 10 ASEAN member states of our Indonesia sometimes uh, act within its strategic autonomy to may not always follow uh, all the maritime security regiment that is currently uh, available. So moving on, um, and but this should not be seen or interpreted in any way as a rejection or a breakdown perhaps of Indonesia uh, with US or any other uh, countries relations. Uh, with the United States in particular, Indonesia does consider it as one of its most uh, important security partners in the realm, in maritime realm. However, Indonesia's uh, fundamental position, as I mentioned earlier, as a non-aligned state is based on its uh, preserving the strategic autonomy of the state through its uh, free and active policy, and that the main priority of such uh, free and active policy is, whether it's foreign policy or maritime security policy, is that it, it should ensure the stability of the Southeast Asian region through the Association of Southeast Asian Nations or ASEAN. And this brings me to my third and final topic uh, in a way on how Indonesia tries to establish its maritime security position vis-a-vis -vis, uh, ASEAN. Um, as I mentioned earlier on how Indonesia promotes uh, ASEAN centrality and also ASEAN within its foreign policy, it's because it has an interest that uh, any issues, any international issues arise uh, shall not destabilize or even ultimately perhaps dissolve ASEAN. I think as we have seen um, in the past year or so, the crisis, that, uh, in, the crisis in Myanmar has already exacerbated not only um, strategic issues, but also exacerbated maritime security issues that are currently experienced by Indonesia and other ASEAN member states, such as an increasing number of people trafficking and people smuggling, as well as illicit movement of goods and other people. So in preparing for Indonesia's chairmanship of ASEAN by next year in 2023, there are efforts that the relevant authorities are taking place to promote an agenda that signifies, that signifies greater ASEAN stability and centrality, including one of it, through a possible uh, plan of action-like document for the uh, ASEAN outlook of the Indo for the Indo-Pacific, and also perhaps introducing a, a novel perspective of maritime security that might in, in, enshrine uh, a, a certain perspective or policy, not just by Indonesia, but by all 10 ASEAN member states on how it should uh, look and, uh, and, and, and act upon the various maritime security issues that might happen in the, in the future. As some of the experts here have seen and currently understand, the ASEAN outlook of the Indo-Pacific at its current form lack the concrete actions that you know, showcase its inclusivity, is, despite having maritime uh, security and also uh, maritime sphere within its, uh, within its document. And as mentioned by, uh, just like mentioned by His Excellency Ambassador Christophe Benoit earlier, AOIP would also need more flesh to make the document more practicable, to make other uh, external partners be able to, uh, to, to, to provide its you know, cooperation between ASEAN and, and the others. And what I could underline now is that for Indonesia and to an extent uh, ASEAN, uh, it, it sees that both the opportunities and also threats within the region can come from the maritime realm. And by that logic, uh, Indonesia would like ASEAN to enforce it, reinforce itself to try to effectively absorb all of these opportunities and threat. And to that end, uh, it is hoped as well that should another security issue of global proportion come in, in the near future or in the future, in the long future, such as the Brussels ukrainian war that we see now, um, that ASEAN member states can and should be ready to stand firm with a hopefully a more enhanced rules-based ASEAN way. Uh, with that, I would I should stop my presentation. I'll return the screen back to the moderator. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Canberra. It is absolutely perfect. You you stick 
uh, exactly to the 10 minutes allocated. <laughs> so I can at least thank you for, for that and for your um, interesting perspective on uh, Indonesian practice uh, with a concrete example uh, regarding uh, restriction that uh, Jakarta is applying uh, regarding some, some element of the um, IMO uh, uh, regulation. And I, I took note regarding the SUA. Um, and I know, and we all know that this is not preventing Jakarta to, to follow uh, to follow the convention of, uh, of Montego Bay, uh, to which, by the way, a very well-known um, Indonesian uh, legal expert uh, greatly uh, contributed. <laughs> I wanted to remind uh, the audience of, uh, of that, of course. And without um, any uh, any more delay, I, I will turn now to our uh, second speaker of the panel, and I'm calling now Vijay, Dr. Sapuja. If uh, Vijay, you are with us, yes, we can see uh, you. Great pleasure to see you there, Vijay. So the floor is um, is you. You are going to deliver for for us, I guess, the perspective of. Uh, uh, an Indian perspective on maritime security. So the floor is yours, Vijay. Thank you, Mary Ann. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be on a panel uh, where experts come and present their perspectives. And I think it's, it's a double, uh, you know, it makes it double interesting because we have a lot of friendly faces around and I'm not going to run into rough weather. Uh, well, I, I thought, you know, uh, looking at the Indo-Pacific, I thought it'd be a good idea if I gave an Indian perspective. And why I call it Indian perspective, because we have, uh, we, we look at the region uh, probably, you know, from a civilizational perspective also. And uh, of course, you know, when, when you look at the Indo-Pacific, it is very large. And um, the contemporary understanding, uh, or rather I should say cartographic uh, imagination is much wider as far as uh, I'm concerned, or for that matter, in India. We take Africa into consideration. For us, the Indo-Pacific would be large, starting from, say, African coast, Arabian Sea, Pure Bengal, it goes through Southeast Asia, Northeast Asia, the Pacific Islands, and the maritime littoral spaces of the Americas. Now, if that's such a large canvas that we are going to be working on, I think each, each space has its unique challenges. And if that be the case, I think we need responses of a different kind. And that's what my presentation will focus on. Well, I have some very good news from the region. Economic, if you look at the economic order, there's good news that the RCEP, of course, India did not join. The Americans are coming with their own perspective, another a, a partnership of its own kind. Notwithstanding the differences and India not having joined, I think there is a lot of opportunity for India to participate and partake from the economic growth that's going on. And these institutions are helping us to literally build on our economy. However, my concern comes in this region is essentially the great power rivalry, China and the United States, it's evident and particularly focused on South China Sea. And you know, it is generating to my mind, uh, plenty of political, diplomatic, economic, strategic contestation. The word here focusing, I'm focusing on is on contestation. And this is also shaping alignments. That is actually worrying us in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, another worrying aspect is, of course, the ongoing war, Russia, Ukraine, and that also has some, because that now has created a, a kind of political strategic dilemmas. Who are you with? We already had a dilemma when it was South China Sea. Who are you with? With China, with the United States. I think we now have yet another dilemma, which, is, which I call, with, you are with Russia, or, with, or for that matter, or uh, you're with uh, uh, Ukraine, or for that matter, you're with NATO. I think here again was a challenge for us sitting in New Delhi. Who do we go? Again, the word strategic autonomy comes into picture. Each one has their own national interests. And that's where I think it's important to respect the national interests. And I think it's time that we looked at dilemmas which are now focused on uh, uh, more on national interest. And strategic autonomy will be always that play. So, but I borrow liberally from Barry Buzon and I say there are security complexes. You know, if I look at, uh, I, I move from east to west, I'll call it uh, Pacific Island security complex. It's unique, it has its own challenges. Then there is the Western Pacific, which includes South China Sea. 
I think that sometimes it is being referred to as the hotspot. Then, of course, we have the maritime Southeast Asia, not to forget Bay of Bengal, which I'll talk about, also the Arabian Sea. And then we have East Africa, another security conflict, and Southern Indian Ocean. So it's, it's fair for me to argue that if I was to borrow what kind of security dynamics are going on in the South China Sea, I cannot bring them literally a, a kind of a response mechanism for the Bay of Bengal. So for that matter, I have chosen two security complexes, the North Arabian Sea and the Bay of Bengal. And we figure very much, uh, we, you know, as India, we have them on the East and the West. So I'm going to first begin with the North Arabian Sea. Uh, well, let me assess the security dynamics or security kind of, a, let's say, the, 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 the way it's being played out in the North Arabian Sea. One is at the first at the first level, I call it classic security, pivoting on numerous past and ongoing wars, right? Uh, again, it involves not just the uh, local, uh, let's say, the, the, the regional countries, but extra regional parts who've been there. You know, we have... United States, we got NATO, we got the European Union, we got Asians, we got GCC countries. Now, if you really put them together, again, they, there are groupings which have been formed, led, led by the United States, sometimes by you know, European Union. Operation Atlanta is a good example here. All right. And then, of course, we all joined hands together when we came to combat piracy. So there was something called as public goods at sea. The nations realized that we had to deliver public goods at sea. So we came together. However, there are security dynamics of a different kind. Uh, we saw the Gulf War. We saw Operation Enduring Freedom, Iraqi Freedom. And we have multiple of what I would call violent non-state actors, such as you know, Al-Qaeda, you got ISIS, Hezbollah, Hamas, Al-Shabaab, and if you see uh, Ansar Allah in Yemen. We tend to forget Yemen. Now, this is a new security dynamic altogether. But I, it's also, I feel that it's instructive to mention about the nuclear dynamics that are at play in this region. You have lots of countries who possess land-based ballistic and cruise missiles, air launch capability, and not to forget nuclear submarines. In South Asia, let me begin, particularly in the context of, um, let's say, a North Arabian Sea, India and Pakistan possess nuclear weapon capability and have sufficient, I use the word sufficient, nuclear weapon stockpile, but they're able to deter a kind of strategic stability prevails. India operates a nuclear submarine. Pakistan can say that I don't kind, I do not wish to operate a submarine, but it has chosen a conventional submarine, miniaturize the warhead, and that also adds to rather, I call it insecurity. There are no signaling on. So this, what I called it in the same breath, while I use the word strategic stability, but in the same breath, I'm using the word strategic instability. Yes. This causes another kind of a dilemma and security concerns. Now, Iranians are worried about these Israelis. Iran, Israeli submarines have been sighted in the North Arabian Sea. Saudi Arabia is worried about the Iranian nuclear stockpile. So if you see, we tend to look at the entire region purely from a classic security but there is the nuclear dynamics and all, not to forget, we also, we, there was an effort made to create a Middle East nuclear weapon free zone way back sometimes in 1974. Proposed by Iran, seconded by Egypt, but then where is it gone? Everybody. Now the nuclear dynamics, we have to take into consideration when we are talking about the Indo-Pacific security. Let me quickly move on to Bay of Bengal. Now, this is a, a good story. You know, here the, the you know there is concentration on non-traditional security threats, human issue, human security issues, environment, ecology, and these impact on human security. That's where the focus is. This is in total contrast to what I see in the North Arabian Sea or Arabian Sea, as far as India is concerned. Littoral countries: Bangladesh, Myanmar, Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, Sri Lanka, India. I think we have a web of kind of engagements that are about. BIMSEC is a very, very good example. Majority of the countries are engaged through the BIMSEC. We host the Milan series of naval exercises. The con congregation navies come and talk about their concerns, challenges, et cetera. But then, you know, they're also building up kind of capacity, uh, you know, in terms of responding to, you know, uh, they conduct operations. And there's a partnership at the bilateral level and also at the multilateral level to address non-traditional security threats and challenges. They vary from even socioeconomic challenges, climate-induced challenges, a variety of them. But then this region also has 
I wouldn't say that it does not have, you know, geostrategic uh, uh, contestation too, but this is on much lower scale. You know, we already have things like India-China rivalry. Then we have the quadrilateral security dialogue. We also have uh, the Belt Chinese Belt Road Initiative, and then dependence on Chinese uh, largest that can potentially create another set of security dynamics in the region. India has enduring strategic interests in the Indo-Pacific, and it is committed to you know, economic, commercial linkages, and the imperative is that we want something that is open, inclusive, and transparent, Indo and of course, rule of law. Overall, it's kind of a broad umbrella under which the India, India would like to play and it's, it plays part as a responsible actor in the Indo-Pacific. What India has done, while this discourse continues, India has also conceptualized called the Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative, IPOI. And this is an open, inclusive, non-treaty-based global initiative for mitigating challenges. It's got seven pillars. And all of them bring in a lot of things like sustainable development goals, development issues, climate issues. And you know these seven pillars are maritime security, of course, what we are discussing today, disaster risk reduction, we're talking about science and technology, capacity building. We're talking about technology, science, technology, cooperation, trade, and equity, a host of things. These seven pillars are very important. And we try to bend this, these pillars and we want to create a stakeholdership by bringing in partners. And we have very great stories for this. And I would like to share, very quickly share with you. Uh, Japan okay. leads the center. Very, very quickly, Vijay, you, you have one minute left, if I may. <laughs> so I will take just one minute, Maria. Okay, uh, great. Uh, we have, for instance, Japan leads the connectivity pillar. Australia leads the ecology pillar. France co-leads now maritime security uh, and also the ecology. Now, look at the kind of investment that are coming in from our partners who are stakeholders in the entire IPOI. Finally, I think it's uh, fair to argue that there's a tendency to assess Indo-Pacific security dynamics through a single prism, using a broad brush and that about the security dynamics. I think that my fear is that will lead us to flawed conclusions. Instead, a sub-regional approach based on security complex offers a better solution because we have classic security, we have nuclear security, non-traditional security issues, and transnational security. I'll stop at that. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sakucha. Uh, a very rich, uh, very rich uh, painting with uh, uh, many complex and uh, interrelated uh, uh, topic. And I'm, I'm sure we will uh, uh, come back on some point, and particularly the nuclear dynamic that you, you, you clearly pointed out, um, well, in link with uh, the submarine navigation, and there are more and more submarine navigating in, in the water of the Indo-Pacific. Uh, we, we had one of our panelists uh, who is going to, to develop maybe more this point. Thank you again. Um, going now to our uh, third panelist, Dr. Yoshizaki. Professor Yoshizaki from uh, the National Institute of Defense Studies. And I suppose he is uh, with us even from, from Tokyo. Uh, Tomo, uh, yes. do you hear me? Yeah, I don't see you on my screen, but I guess you're coming. Yeah. Great, okay. we can see you. Great to see you. So we are ready to, to listen to your presentation. Uh, with great interest and, and, and pleasure. Uh, please try to stick, stick in the 10 minutes presentation if you can, thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Marianne. And uh, thank you very much for having me. It's my great pleasure. I'm a professor of uh, National Institute for Defense Studies, which is a, a counterpart of the EHUDN in Paris and also IRISEM. And, uh, and now I'm at the Vice President of NIT now, they're working on academic issues. And before that, I was the Director of Policy Simulations, the position to think about the unthinkable, well, black swan situation like today, like a Ukraine and COVID. We have so many black swans. And uh, let me limit myself three points, three points. 
regarding the Ukraine impact on the connectivity or free and open in the Pacific vision from Japanese perspective. Number two. Are you sharing your screen? Yeah. Number one issue is that ocean connectivity is being lost. Number two is Japan's policy of the support to the open regionalism, especially ASEAN, is being challenged. The third, not the least, is so-called the Ukraine dilemma. Ukraine is not a member of NATO, but the partner which affects the whole NATO region. And think about this situation here in the Indo-Pacific. We have many alliances in this region, but uh, we have so many other partners. And what will be the impact on the Ukraine situation upon in the Pacific region? Okay, let me start with the first one: uh, ocean connectivity, and uh, the issue is uh, resilience. National resilience is uh, being challenged. Think about uh, Zelensky. Delinsky uh, is taking the lead, having a international network and SNS and uh, Zoom meeting and uh, e-connectivity throughout the world. Uh, but in case of um, Afghanistan, what happened? Uh, President Ghani didn't have a connectivity, didn't have a grip of the government. So what matter would be the resilience, which will be a foundation for our maritime or the aerial uh, connectivity. Let me uh, add one thing uh, to the connectivity, COVID, COVID-19 hampered a connectivity. We shut down and we um, they limited our accesses. Today, we are doing Zoom, not face-to-face, -face, so that's the reality. So we have so many disconnectivity, disconnectivity right now e-technology can help or overcome this disconnectivity, but the COVID-19 plus Ukraine situation enhance the danger of um, the uh, risk of connectivity because we may, you may be attacked, you may be um, the targeted. So what matter would be the key word would be resilience, resilience. And, um, Following the concept of resilience from NATO or European Union, we learned a lot. And uh, let me list seven points uh, pointed, about, pointed by NATO, but that which is very critical to think about our connectivity, ocean connectivity in the Pacific. Uh, number one is that critical government services is, is very important, just like Zelensky have a global reach. Uh, Afghanistan didn't have one. So government services will be the core of the connectivity and the resilience. Number two is energy supply. Okay, maritime connectivity cannot maintain uh, you see the, without the energy connectivity. The third one is a movement of people. We have millions of refugees or displaced person right now that are there in the Ukraine. That can happen if we have a major atrocity or a major conflict here in this region. The fourth one is the food and water resources supply is a key to resilience. And it's shown in the case of Ukraine. And, uh, so, so the challenge is that food and water uh, resources uh, may affect the prices or the public support to the government. So that's critical. Number four and number five is mass casualty. Unfortunately, it's happening there in Ukraine and the world is witnessing. So the protection of innocent civilian is deeply related to European Union and NATO's or the Japan's or other uh, like-minded partner help support. That's critical. And uh, number six is a civil communication system must be maintained in order to have a resilience and connectivity. And the last one is the, the transport system. In case of Ukraine, it was challenged 
by Russian attack and the transportation to the Ukraine and other region is very much limited. So in that sense, these seven area, okay, government, energy, movement, food, and the civil communication, transport, food and water, these are the foundation for keeping resilience, including in the Pacific. Then I'll move on to the second one, Japan's policy vis-a-vis -vis free and open in the Pacific, especially uh, Japan's support to ASEAN, open regionalism and ASEAN centrality in our mind. The key one is that Japan's policy to support the capacity building of the ASEAN countries and other regional partners. For example, in case of maritime law or air and space law, uh, these are common asset to be uh, shared. So in that sense, the Japan's uh, the posture is in line with the overall ASEAN regional centrality and transparency. And uh, we do want the quality infrastructure uh, to be shared, including China. This is uh, critical that we try to open up even now with the China. If they stick to the principle of the quality infrastructure, the quality infrastructure have some the condition. Number one is transparency. Number two is accountability of that project. So if China and others and even Russia share this kind of norm, uh, it is open. But if not, uh, it depend, It has a huge uh, implication. Okay, let me conclude with the last one. Ukraine dilemma. Like, uh, well, here in this region, in the Pacific, US have a hub and spoke network and alliance commitment, like a US-Japan alliance of the Article 5, the Article 5 US-Japan alliance, which means that collective response to the common challenges. And uh, Tokyo, Seoul, Australia, and the Philippine Manila are uh, they bound by the ally. Sorry, my camera is not uh, uh, working properly. Uh, but the thing is, the hub and spoke system has a solid foundation. But, okay, think about other countries. ASEAN is not allied, and you're trying to have an open regional liberalism. So, the what if big major incident happens or attack happens like a Ukraine, then partnership would be a, uh, would be challenged. How far we can have alliance management plus the partnership management and how we can mitigate the concerns of the gap between the alliances and partnership. I think that is a critical question we have to think in case of the Ukraine plus what if something happened in this region. I will stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for this very uh, stimulating point. Uh, um, in fact, the notion of connectivity, we all agree that it is really very, very important. And notably when we want to cover uh, a so vast zone as uh, Indo-Pacific. And uh, to, to be frank, I will have the temptation to, to mention the South Pacific example, uh, you know, when you're speaking about resilience and protection of population, communication, uh, and so on. But I, I guess we will have the opportunity to, to come back uh, on, on this in the question and answer period. And I, I did remark, and, and sorry if I'm already outspoken, uh, you didn't mention the word of Taiwan. You prefer refer to the Ukrainian scenario, but I, I'm sure that some of um, our uh, other panelists or attendants uh, will challenge you with a more precise question and by putting some precise name uh, on, the, uh, on the potential use of force scenario in the uh, environment of the Indo-Pacific. Well, I, I stop there and I'm calling our um, fourth uh, panelist, uh, François-Xavier Bonnet. François-Xavier, I, I know you are with, uh, with us because you you try uh, your PowerPoint 
a few yes. minutes ago. Uh, uh, you hear me? Yes, very well. Okay, so, so we are eager to listen to your presentation okay, uh, regarding so, uh, the South China Sea, a bastion for submarine. I will share the, my screen. It seems working very well. It's working yes, very we well. Can see, yes, we can see your first uh, slide. Okay. Thanks you so can much. go ahead for 10 minutes, please, okay. Francois Xavier. <laughs> so, uh, with tension in the South China Sea and power rivalries between the United States and China, Several Southeast Asian countries are modernizing their navies and investing in submarines. Oceanographic research, whether civil or military, has become an issue of considerable, considerable geopolitical importance, not only for asserting sovereignty over maritime territories, but also for supporting anti-submarine warfare and enabling surveillance of coasts and straits. Asian countries, such as the Philippines, that have either to remain on the sidelines in this respect are now endeavoring to build their own military oceanographic research facilities. Focusing specifically on the Spratly Island, I will show you the importance of one of the branches of oceanography, which is bathymetry. Economic arguments like fishing and the extraction of hydrocarbons are generally advanced to explain the rivalries over the Spratly between China, Taiwan, Vietnam, the Philippines, Malaysia, and Brunei. However, secret hydrographic research since the 1920s uh, have shown that contrary to popular belief, the Spratly Islands are crossed by deep canyons that act as highways for both conventional and nuclear submarines. A nuclear-powered submarine equipped with ballistic missiles in the Spratly could well threaten a large part of the world. Against this uh, back, uh, backdrop of power rivalries, between China and several ASEAN countries uh, for, all part or, for all or part of the sea, as well as global rivalries between the US and China, Asia, particularly Southeast Asia, is experiencing a growth in submarine acquisitions. In the medium term, we could even see the region become home to over half of the world's conventional submarine fleet. Faced with the still undeniable power of the US in the Pacific, more than half of its submarine fleet is located in the Pacific and consists slow, solely of nuclear powered submarines and the rapid development of China's submarine fleet. Uh, some Southeast Asian countries have started investing in conventional submarines. By 2030, Southeast Asian countries may have a capacity of some 20 modern conventional submarines moored in bases located around the South China Sea. This local capacity with the supplemented, will be supplemented by other Asia-Pacific countries, which plan to purchase about 100 new submarines, also by 2030. The tropical waters of Southeast Asia provide a particularly complex environment for both conventional and nuclear submarines. With relatively shallow seas areas contrasting with a number of deep, deep trenches located on the edge of the continental shelf, the region is also home to numerous islands of varying sizes that create the condition for powerful, powerful currents. A succession of basins uh, are connected through straits or choke points. The largest of these base basins is the South China Sea, a semi-enclosed sea that measures 3.5 million square kilometers and separates continental Asia from the island nations. These bathymetric constraints greatly impact the routes selected by submarines. While con conventional submarines can move around in relatively shallow waters, a limit of 50 meters is often mentioned, nuclear submarines travel at great depth through seas and oceans. More, moreover, few of the straits in Southeast Asia are deep enough to allow the submarines to pass through them, to throw them into in dive mode in complete safety. Less than 10 straits out of 30 or so in Southeast Asia. So although the Malacca Strait, Malacca Strait is a strategic route for international trade and civilian and military transport, it cannot be used by nuclear submarines in dive mode. Indeed, with depth not exceeding 50 meters, only 12 meters at some points, and heavy uh, maritime traffic, the straits present particular difficulties for conventional and nuclear submarine fleets. 
Oceanographic research conducted by both civilians and the military has become a, a matter of considerable geopolitical importance, not only for the US and China, a rival for uh, control of this maritime region, but also for the ASEAN countries, which are equipping themselves with submarines and anti-submarine warfare platforms. Research in geophysics, meteorology, acoustic, uh, magnetism, and seabed gravi uh, gravimetry, uh, and, and, and so on, can be carried uh, out by all companies, civil research centers, and research centers attached to countries' navies. Since 2017, the presence of Chinese scientific research vessels in the Southeast Asian seas, notably in the Philippine EEZ, is increasingly visible, especially along the submarine routes. For example, between 2016 and 2018, the Chinese Navy conducted 48 scientific research missions in the area between Palawan and the Spratly. Only one of these missions had been approved by the Philippine Department of Foreign Affairs. The ASEAN Maritime Transparency Initiative has found that out of 53 survey ships in uh, operation in the Indo-Pacific region uh, during the year 2019 and 2020, 25 of them were Chinese government owned against 10 US government ships. Some, uh, as you can see on, on this map, some segments of the routes used by submarines are highly contested. I will try to, uh, voila. Uh, the, the zoom here, uh, you, you yeah. see the, the route? I, yes, we did. You, yeah. you can see? We, we, we okay. Uh, the, the, the route here is crossing the Spratly area, the dangerous ground, uh, coming from uh, Sanya base in Hainan. Mm -hmm. uh, so the segment used by submarines are highly contested. This is, uh, in fact, it's the Spratly Island. Uh, located off the coast of Palawan, Borneo, and Vietnam in the South China Sea. The numerous studies on this dispute focus primarily on competition over, over national, uh, natural resources, that, such as hydrocarbons uh, and fish, and uh, avoid tackling the issue of bathymetry. Gaining a better understanding of this overlooked issue requires us to de deconstruct the myth that the sea around the Spratly is shallow. Both media and academic articles describe the area around the Spratly as a shallow sea that is extremely dangerous for shipping and should be avoided at all costs. Uh, up until the 1920s, charts of the islets and reefs of the Spratly were made to improve the safety of trade routes through the South China Sea. The charts were intended to alert vessels to the dangers of the, in this region and to direct them to bypass the Spratly. The charts showed two distinct geographical areas. The western part, known since the 19th century, included nine groups of islets and reefs. The second, the second, the eastern part, was a huge virtually uncharted stretch of sea west of Palawan that was given the appropriate name of Don Giotto's ground. This eastern region was con considered to be very shallow and interspaced with countless reefs. Then the British Admiralty, the Imperial Na uh, Japanese Navy, and the US Navy conducted secret hydrographic, hydrographic research from the 1920s to the 1930s, charting the dangerous ground. The secret hydrographic research of the 1930s enabled the naval authorities of the different countries to conceive this vast maritime territory as an archipelago crossed by secret maritime routes whose depth could exceed 2,500 meters, and which, were, which was therefore conducive to maritime activities. Submarine activities. And you can see on this map the different uh, roads, secret roads discovered during the, uh, the 1920s, 1930s. So, after having been considered as a region to be avoided, the Spratly Islands were increasingly perceived as a strategic territory for any maritime power that could control the internal routes. During the World War II, between July 1943 and August 1945, no less than 42 missions were carried out within the dangerous ground by the US submarines. Contrary to popular belief, the submarine commanders all described the ease with which it was possible to cross dangerous ground using either the east-west route or the north-south route known as the English route or, or route G. 
control of routes through the dangerous ground was important tactically for the American submarine fleet. From the end of 1943, convoys of Japanese super tankers escorted by warships could leave Brunei Bay and Miri and cross dangerous ground. They, they would stop en, en route at the island of Ituaba, where they would refuel before continuing their journey to Japan. Aware of the danger posed by the US submarines in the region, the Japanese convoy avoided the traditional shipping routes and took routes through the Spratly. Since they underestimated US knowledge of dangerous ground, the convoys could easily be ambushed by one or more US submarines. Uh, starting after 1953, 1957 and up, there were uh, numerous uh, kind of uh, uh, survey by Air, US Air Force and by uh, US Navy. And uh, it, was, uh, it is highly likely that the first crossing of dangerous ground by a nuclear submarine took place in April 1972. François, the... François Xavier, if you can come to your conclusion, uh, I can Already? give you one minute's conclusion, <laughs> if you Two can. Minutes, no? <laughs> well, one uh, minute and a half. <laughs> okay. uh, it is highly likely that uh, the first crossing of dangerous ground so, was by USS Sculpin in 1972. So if a US nuclear submarine was able to cross uh, the dangerous ground safely, there was a risk that enemy uh, nuclear submarine could do the same. For this reason, the Philippine government's strategic description of this maritime space uh, was expressed in, uh, in the 1982 Department of Defense publication of the Spratly. And it was seen, in fact, as a place where you have deep passage, these passages, uh, and submerged ballistic missiles submarines could, without uh, danger, if the mapping was done, uh, cross and uh, throw their missiles. And because the area bathymetry was quite complex, uh, it was uh, extremely difficult to counteract even uh, the, the action. So the Spratly played a tactical and local role during the Second World War, but in the era of nuclear submarines, the danger is potentially many times greater threatening a large percentage of the world population. Uh, and so I, I arrived at, at the end, in fact, at this part, which is a uh, bastion for uh, Chinese nuclear uh, submarines. Because in the regional terms, the South China Sea is a key maritime area for Chinese fleet of type 094 gene class nuclear weapon uh, submarines and with ballistic missiles. In fact, the East China Sea north of Taiwan is too shallow for the SSBN to conduct patrols and other operations without being rapidly detected by US and Japanese surveillance system. Conversely, once the submarines have left the Yulin Naval Base in the southern part of the island of Hainan, they can reach the depth of the South China Sea or the Pacific Ocean and attempt to evade the, at the attention of their adversary. Uh, in fact, you can see that the whole of South China Sea mostly is in a blue clear, meaning uh, uh, it's beyond, uh, below 720 meters uh, deep. And so the submarines can go at full, uh, full uh, speed uh, without uh, any risk of uh, uh, touching the ground uh, of the seafloor. The, the dark blue is, uh, you can go at full speed, but you have still a risk uh, of touching the seafloor. So, the, the wool of, of South China Sea is uh, extremely deep and very pro, uh, propitious for uh, maritime, for submarine activities. But the vulnerability of Chinese nuclear submarine fleet largely explains the country's desire to exclude all foreign military forces from the South China Sea. This alone, however, would not be enough for China to protect itself against the potential threat from the US and in particular to carry out the counter-strike on the US uh, mainland. In a war scenario, the type 094 gene class submarine uh, Dulong 2 nuclear type uh, missiles uh, have a range of 8,000 kilometers and will not be able to reach the US mainland from dangerous ground. The only US bases at risk uh, would be Guam, the island of Hawaii, and the bases of uh, US allies in uh, the Pacific. To strike the west coast of the US, the Type 094 would have to uh, leave the South China Sea, pass through the Bashit Channel between the Philippines and Taiwan, and proceed to the East China Sea. This area, however, 
shielded by the first uh, arc of islands composed of Bonsoir. Japan, Taiwan, the Philippines, and Borneo, and heavily <laughs> guarded by the US interrupt. and Japan. <laughs> Uh, you are so, going to add uh, me, just, but maybe okay, I just <laughs> time, to, time to conclude really, really. <laughs> you are over, uh, over the time for uh, conclusion. Right. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> okay. We are we are going to find you uh, for Sir Xavier. So thank you, thank you for for your presentation. No and problem. sorry to 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 interrupt um, um, there. Um, it was quite a, an, an exciting journey <laughs> back uh, back uh, back in time to the Second okay, World yeah. War. Uh, thank you for your talent of geographer and and, and historian. But we, we we could come back on your conclusion and very mm -hmm. operational, I, I guess, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, right to the current challenge of submarine activities in the South China Sea uh, in the in the Q and A uh, session. Because I, I know that we we need to spare time for um, listening to our last speaker, uh, Admiral um, Jean Mathieu Ray. I understand, uh, Christine, that it is a recorded uh, presentation. So maybe I'm going to let the floor to uh, our technician. Okay, here we are. Um, waiting for the sound. Thank you for the floor and Yaorana, as we say in Tahitian language. I first want to thank you for your invitation. This is a great pleasure for me to be here with you today and to speak to this IRASEC webinar. It will be better if I could have been with you in person in Bangkok, but I am very honored to speak to such an audience. I first would like to present you with my role in this region. As a French sailor and also a regional commander, my role is to control the French forces operating in Asia Pacific from Malacca to America in dark blue on the map. I am at the head of a joint force composed of assets from the three services, ship from the Navy, aircraft from the Air and Space Force, and from the Navy and regiments from the Marine Infantry. We are temporarily reinforced from Europe. In this extremely vast area, my main mission is the protection of our sovereignty, of our territories, and of our fellow citizens against all threats. This includes dealing with the risk of natural disasters, supporting the civil authorities, as we did recently during the health crisis, protecting our resources, particularly fishing resources, and fighting drug trafficking. My naval chief of staff, Admiral Vandier, recently declared, all the things that are not secure are all looted, or looted and challenging. This is my role to protect the resources of France in the region. All my assets successfully protect this area on a daily basis. They provide assistance at sea and on land for the benefits of the entire Polynesian population. For example, transportation between the 118 islands of the French Polynesia. As a reminder, French Polynesia is a territory as large as Europe. We must face with what we call the tyranny of distance. This territory is in an area which is now becoming the heart of the world. Since 2018, the French authorities have been using the concept of Indo-Pacific instead of Asia-Pacific. Thus, the same year, France released its Indo-Pacific strategy. We recently updated it. This semantic evolution reflects a change in the policy and even in the world view. It is the acknowledgement that the area is now a strategic place. That place is now located in the core of French concern. The expertise of France is also known in specific domains that are the core activity of the armed forces in the Indo-Pacific region. These areas of excellence are the state action at sea or 
Coast Guard function, as well as Acharya, humanitarian aid and disaster relief. That is the main reason of Mahara exercise, conducting every two years from Tahiti and every other year from New Caledonia and call Southern Cross exercise. This year, Mahara exercise will be conducted on Bora Bora Island. It will gather 16 nations and around 1,000 soldiers. This kind of interactions could gather nations on Acharya activities. In that spirit, we operated with our partners in Tonga in January. In addition to the protection of French Polynesia and the Polynesian citizens, with our partners as a Pacific nation, and in application of France's strategy in the Indo-Pacific, we ensure the respect of international law and the freedom of navigation in common spaces to promote multilateralism and to struggle against nuclear proliferation. France aims to be a power of balance and always seeks for peaceful resolution of conflicts. The French armed forces intervene all over the Indo-Pacific from South America to the African coast via Singapore and Indonesian Straits. We did it during all the last year with deployment from every component. SSN Emerald operated in the area for several months. Aircraft carrier Charles de Gaulle conducted operation around India, especially in the Indian Ocean. The Army conducted amphibious exercise Arc 21 from amphibious task group Jandark on Japan ground. And Air and Space Forces finally sent Rafale fighters, their tanker, Airbus Phoenix, and transporter A400 Atlas from mainland to the heart of Pacific last summer in Tahiti and Hawaii. This deployment, called FRA, was a major achievement both in logistic and operational levels. This surge was the biggest activity that we had for a long time. Recently, French Navy frigate Vendémiaire operated in China and Philippine Seas. The crew also supported ECC mission, Enforcement Coordination Cell mission, of North Korea against nuclear proliferation. This operation is dedicated to the implementation of UN Security Council sanctions against North Korea and gather many countries. During 2022, France will continue to deploy its assets in the area. This summer, the French Air and Space Forces will conduct Pegasus operation. Pegasus operation occurs every even year, when FRA operation occurs every odd year. They will also attend pitch black exercise in Australia. For France, the area is a geographical, human, strategic and economic reality due to its presence in both oceans with its five overseas territories New Caledonia, French Polynesia, Wallis and Futuna in Pacific and La Réunion and Mayotte in Indian Ocean. Close to two million French citizens live there. The EZ of all these territories makes France with more than 9 million square kilometers as the largest EZ of the region. Just let me give you some points to figure out what it means exactly for the French armed forces. In 2021, it was 1,000 hours at sea for fishing surveillance, more than 1,200 fishing vessels monitored from Tahiti, more than 200 fishing reported by our MPA, Maritime Patrol Aircraft. Indo-Pacific is also an area that today concentrates more than 60% of the world's wealth. In 2019, the region represented 20% of France's imports and also 15% of the exports. And the figures are increasing. 
As a result, the area is an issue of major importance and is a priority for France, but also for the European Union. France supports the development of a regional maritime security architecture that promotes multilateralism. We also foster the expansion of mutual knowledge and information sharing. I believe that we need to exchange with partners on a regular basis to share our strategic visions in order to contribute to the stability of the region. Dialogue is the basis of the understanding. It is the best way to ensure peace, especially when it comes to the rules and limits. It also prevents escalation and miscalculation. To my mind, and it is the French position as a power of balance, we have to discuss with all our partners, even with our competitors. In this spirit, I recently had a fruitful discussion with my counterpart in PRC, General Wang, based in Canton. In order to promote multilateralism and to develop cooperation and partnerships with many nations in the region, I started in November 2021 a cycle of annual high-level workshops for the Coast Guards. This was made just after an announcement for, at the French Oceania Summit on July 2021. It helped us to improve maritime security through a better surveillance of the EEZ, exchanges of maritime information and various trainings. The second session is planned on June in New Caledonia. I also attend various regional cooperation organizations in the Indo-Pacific, such as the CHOS, Chief of Defense Symposium, and WPNS, Western Pacific Naval Symposium. In that spirit, France demonstrates significant interest for ASEAN institutions, such as ADMM+, ASEAN Defense Minister Meeting. Concerning the Maritime Domain Awareness, we are involved in the Information Fusion Centers network. These places are located in Madagascar, New Delhi, Singapore, where one officer of my staff acts as a liaison officer, and the ones recently created in Vanuatu and in Callao, Peru. I have also other liaison officers in the region, one at Singapore, Commander Jeremy Bachelier, in IFC, and in the U.S. Logistical Fleet, in Japan, in the U.S. 7th HQ, and in the ECC HQ, but also in U.S. Indopacom headquarters in Hawaii, and another one in the United Nations Command in South Korea. We also engage in humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, HLDR through mechanisms such as the France, France-Australia New Zealand Agreement, or through multilateral exercises such as Thousand Cross or Marara I previously mentioned. We did one operation recently for Tonga after the disaster that hit this country. With the coordination of France, we sent humanitarian aid on board French a naval patrol vessel and aircraft from New Caledonia and French Polynesia. France is the only sovereign European power in the region, but she is also part of the EU. In this respect, the European Union has released its own strategy for the Indo-Pacific on September the 15th of 2021. This is a major step forward. The European strategy in the region is based on a wide range of initiatives, including the aim to conclude free trade agreements. This desire for partnership also extends to ocean management or climate change, so as to allow Europeans to establish a sustainable presence in the Indo-Pacific region. In addition, to the economic and environmental fields, the European Union has also set ambitious objectives in terms of defense and maritime security. 
In particular, it wishes to ensure the enhancement of the naval deployments of member states, notably by extending the concept of coordinated maritime CMP. This concept started from the Guinean Gulf in Africa and will be used in the Indian Ocean and soon in the Pacific. It contributes to the reinforcement of the capacities of partner countries. For example, through the CRIMARIO, Critical Maritime Routes Indian Ocean, which is a maritime route awareness program that was recently extended from the Indian Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. In that spirit, the French Navy ship Vendémiaire conducted a CRIMARIO exercise during a recent port of call in Manila. In this context, France is ready to assume its role as a European country by taking advantage of its long experience in the region. In this mind, France took the presidency of the Council of the EU last January with the objective of implementing more cooperative action with every partner in the area. Once again, thank you for the floor. It was an honor to be invited to this seminar and to be able to express to you the views of France and EU for maritime security in the region. As an operational commander in the area, I try to expose to you the role of my country and the initiatives France is promoting to be a balancing power. Thank you for your attention. Okay, great. Uh, I think, yes. Uh, well, that was a very comprehensive uh, presentation. And uh, I have uh, slightly the impression that the, the admiral, as uh, maybe general officer privilege, took over more than 10 uh, minute presentation. <laughs> but uh, it, it, was, it was very, very rich. Uh, I, I'm now looking at uh, the presenter because it appears that we have just only 10 minutes uh, for a question and uh, answer period um, before, before the, the break, or maybe we can uh, extend uh, literally uh, slightly. I, I do not see any, um, any um, specific um, question. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to take advantage of uh, the presence of so brilliant panelists uh, to, uh, to ask um, a question. Uh, in fact, you, you had very, uh, very various points in your presentation, uh, each, uh, each of you, and I took some of them. Uh, and uh, I have uh, the feeling, uh, you know, uh, maybe it's a question of a uh, uh, submarine or seeing some, some uniform at the end of the presentation. But I had the feeling, and maybe the, the audience also, that the Indo-Pacific is becoming quite an over-militarized uh, space uh, with uh, a kind of prevalence of a competitive view uh, with uh, the deployment of uh, naval assets, uh, with a very traditional security threat, uh, you know. Uh, and I have the impression uh, that for many littoral and island states, and they are the majority in the Indo-Pacific, uh, some of these concerns uh, are very, very far for their, from their daily preoccupation. Um, what I mean is that I hear very little about the blue economy, uh, about EU fishing, uh, about maybe climate change, yes, uh, a little, uh, because I had the impression that this is a, the major, I will say, perception of, of threat uh, by uh, many countries, uh, many states in the Indian Ocean, in the South Pacific, for example, and that we are very far from, from submarine, even if we do not have to neglect, uh, of course, uh, the impact, destabilizing impact of any arm race uh, and so on. So uh, just to, to short, how do you balance this perspective? Um, do you think that we are really responding 
to the majority of the perception of the littoral state of the Indian Ocean by putting too much accent on this, uh, I will say, navalization of the, of the Indo-Pacific. And do you see some, I will say, uh, preferential area of cooperation between EU and your respective country uh, just to, to try to correct this perception and to fit perfectly with the means that EU is, is willing to, to put in cooperating. Um, and, and EU, you may understand, is very, very committed to the maritime security of the region. So um, I will come back to you um, and, 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 and try to receive your, your answer, perception uh, regarding this, if I've been uh, clear enough uh, in, uh, in, my, uh, in my question. And I will come back to the order of speaking. I will come back to you, uh, Dylan, and uh, after Vijay, Tom, and, and, and so on. Uh, Dylan, what do you think about this over-militarization of the Indo-Pacific, and what can we do to correct that? First, thank you so much, Marianne, for the comments and also question. And I cannot agree more with you. And this is also somewhat re represented within my own country as well in a way that it seems might make things right. Um, and that's, uh, if I can, if I, if I understand a little bit from your comments, it, it may also touch upon issues of maritime law enforcement, right? As an aspect of maritime security, which uh, it, within my country is also somewhat paramilitarized. So, I mean, if, my, if I have my own, uh, preference on 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 having a maritime law enforcement agency or or dealing with the aspects of uh, of, of criminal issues on maritime realm, I would prefer much more uh, civilian counterpart, a more a more uh, a civilian perspective. But alas, um, that's not the thing that we how we do it here. Uh, it's a long story. It, it, it may deserve a whole new uh, webinar in it, but that's a, that's how it goes. But um, on, on the civilian side, um, on our foreign policy side, when it comes to the Indo-Pacific, um, Indonesia actually has a lot of um, capacity building cooperation with a number of South Pacific islands, with a number of um, other Asia Pacific or other Indo-Pacific islands as well. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, we have had held a lot of cooperation with Fiji. We also had a co cooperation with uh, other, I'm not too much sure on, on what the name, but other uh, South Pacific Islands to address the same issues that we have with them, which is IUU fishing. That's mm -hmm. something that we are uh, very experienced with and something that we also like to share on what the best possible practice on, in, in mitigating such issues. Uh, there are also other areas of um, uh, law enforcement cooperation that also being held. But uh, it may not, or at least it hasn't really, it hasn't deserved, or at least it has yet to be attracted by mainstream media or something. So it, is, it, is, it has not attracted that much of attention in comparison with other uh, cooperation that may, as you mentioned, much more over-militarized uh, in nature. Uh, but it, it, if we're talking about connectivity in your last question as well, on what possibly I can hope uh, Southeast Asian countries can cooperate with European countries in that matter. Um, it's certainly on the aspect of connectivity, but specifically on the issue or more on the people-to-people -people connectivity in a way that, I mean, despite having uh, ASEAN European strategic partner, uh, despite having the moniker or status of a strategic partner between ASEAN and the European Union, it has to be noted that most of us here in Southeast Asia still has very little understanding of Europe vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, I mean, vice versa as well. And that uh, is because of the very little people-to-people -people exchange due to, you know, bureaucratic issues and uh, travel barriers and et cetera. Uh, so there is still a discrepancy on how we, between each other, see each other, understand each other, and travel between each other. So all these talks about political cooperation and coming to an understanding on various maritime law enforcement or maritime security issues may at the very end prove very little of benefit if by the end of the day, if I just ask someone at the station here in Jakarta of what do you think of the European Union and et cetera, and all they have is just a shrug of their shoulder. And that has happened quite a lot um, until now. So that's my answer for you, Marian. thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you, Jill. And uh, I'm sure that our um, EU colleague uh, will, will take note of your proposal, interesting proposal to develop people-to-people uh, -people exchange and to know more about each other and maybe to make more EU public diplomacy about what EU has to offer in the maritime domain. Itai, what, what is what can be your input coming from an uh, Indian perspective? about all of this? Uh, <clears throat> I, I think, you know, we're going through a phase of um, excessive militarization, that is without doubt, but that's a reality. If that mm. be the reality, how do we manage it? But if really go back to Cold War, the, it ends in sometimes in 1990s, 99, rather 1991, and we had that full decade, we were trying to figure out whether it is going to be unipolar or multipolar. 2001, terrorist attacks in the United States, and then the entire discourse changes for the next decade and a half. By 2016, I think the militarization process had become. And today, if you look at it in 2022, we, we are seeing the results of it. There is a contestation on. But then at the same time, you know, while this, this contestation or securitization or militarization or navalization as you use the term, I think there is also a discourse which is building up in development of uh, ocean economy, the blue economy. I mean, there's a lot that the you know uh, European uh, Europe's uh, EU's concept of ocean economy or blue economy, uh, also India's blue economy. I think there are a lot of convergences. We're talking about the same thing, and uh, I think in uh, EU you have a much more sophisticated approach to development of ocean risk. Thank you very much, Vichai, for for this. For us uh, in India. We oh, believe sorry. that Indo-Pacific Oceans, uh, so the very fact that the Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative, if you look at the seven pillars, are meant for that in, in terms of development, in terms of ocean economy, in terms of bringing, addressing climate change, while militarization, navalization continues. There are opportunities, and I go with uh, uh, Dr. Kimbara to suggest that you know, capacity building is the order of the day, whether it is maritime legal capacity building, law enforcement, I think it's, I would call it, although it's capacity building, you find the, uh, the term being used in majority of the outcome documents, rather it's fashionable to use, but I think it is desirable too, that that's what we can do to help each other. So cooperation still remains with us while we compete in terms of, you know, uh, uh, selective competition goes on between United States and China, but then we find a lot of cooperation between India and ASEAN, India and Euro European Union. So in, in the broader context, I see a lot of opportunities, um, but we cannot be uh, oblivious of the fact that uh, there is an arms, not a race, arms build up, which is underway. Natural, it's a natural threat process, which the navies find that they need to have a really expensive and sophisticated toys, only then they can fight the wars. I'll stop it there, thank you. Thank you, Vichai. Finally, you, you, you try to finish on a, a kind of positive uh, tone. Uh, of course, we need Navy to, to defend and to secure the sea lane of communication. There is, uh, there is no, no doubt that the uh, Indo-Pacific uh, needs uh, gray, uh, gray fuel. But also, I have the feeling that the recent dynamic was uh, giving more, uh, more role uh, more attractiveness to, to the Coast Guard and to the white fuel. Uh, and the Coast Guard diplomacy was more or less uh, a process um, initiated and supported, initiated by Japan and largely supported by India and US. So, uh, Tom, I, I let you the floor if you want to elaborate a little uh, over this. Thank you. Um, let me be very quick. First one is that as I talk over the Kulimario initiative okay. in Africa and Mombasa and Kenya, the, the Japan's policy is uh, clearly defined. First one is that uh, law and maritime law enforcement, Coast Guard, the education provision of the small vessels, which is tailored for the size of the country or ports. And that must be regulated and educated. And for the longer term development, the key point is that 
my time connectivity should be the foundation of the longer term development, not only for the country who invested, but also the target host country. If we have a longer term sustainable mutual benefit and attention we can do and silence in the gum. If you look at the Somali case, okay, piracy rate, piracy damage is decreased. And that's very positive. That means we have a structured cooperation with a long-term development in sight. But let me uh, um, be frank. This is the exception, not the norm. Okay, think about the, our regions. Maritime, as you uh, described, competitions is increasing. And uh, so uh, law enforcement endeavor can be a trigger of the disputes. Uh, this is an unfortunate reality. So what matter is the dialogue cooperations is the foundation for the, the uh, this kind of things. And what matter is the political liability is the reality. So uh, we talk about the capacity building is a kind of soft power and coast guard diplomacy is a very powerful tool, but we must admit that this is limited in nature. I will stop here, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. Uh, it's it's very wise and uh, very realistic. We, we, we need to, to, to stay pragmatic and uh, EU is a pragmatic uh, actor, even if uh, he is committed uh, to, uh, to be more involved in the security of the Indo-Pacific. Uh, well, I, I will now finish with François Xavier. Uh, yes. François Xavier, do you, do you have any comment that you, you yes. want to, to share uh, with us apart uh, from submarine? For, for example, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> for, for example, in 2016, there was an initiative from Singapore to mm. develop a code of conduct for submarines uh, in the region. But uh, what uh, I try to have uh, more and more information about this, uh, this aspect, but uh, I think this initiative uh, went down and uh, disappeared. So what I think, uh, of course, it will be a complicated thing, but uh, that EU, France, uh, Germany, some, some countries in EU, EU as an organization can help to revive, revive the, the, this initiative. Of course, it will be with US, and with uh, China, we cannot also, it cannot be, uh, is that probably the problem, the problem that because China would like to exclude uh, all uh, assets, especially submarines from uh, foreign countries, it will be difficult to make them part of the group, but we need to have them because China is the biggest uh, number of uh, submarines with, with the US in the region. So, so the proposal could be to develop this, uh, a kind of a working partnership and also to develop uh, to develop this uh, uh, code of conduct for submarines in and to uh, to make it inside the code of conduct for the south china sea in in general a part of uh, of some uh, amendments of the code of conduct uh, so it will be accepted by eu uh, ASEAN and by hopefully China, uh, of course. But of course, it's a dream, but uh, we can uh, we can always hope that uh, something in this uh, sense will uh, will be developed. Thank you, uh, thank you, François Xavier. Yes, I can't help thinking it's quite unrealistic. It's we had <laughs> so many but, difficulties uh, right now to elaborate yes, or to yeah. see or to help. ASEAN country to elaborate an appropriate code of conduct acceptable for every every party and trying to regulate uh, the relation at sea uh, in, in the South China Sea, but submarine and uh, uh, I would say, well, naval submarine, if I can put it like that, not scientific mm. submarine is what I mean, mm. is also complex and specific yeah. issue. Uh, related to the sovereignty of, of states that uh, I can tell you that uh, it will be difficult to, to have um, even uh, you see a mention, public mention of, of, of that, but I'm, I'm sure that they are uh, ongoing uh, uh, in, in, in due and appropriate forum uh, discussion uh, regarding mm -hmm. some countries re um, related to how to avoid uh, unexpected 
uh, encounter at sea, like for the surface ship and, and so on. But this is not my part and I do not have any uh, specific, um, uh, specific information uh, regarding that. Could we um, could we uh, um, come uh, to maybe open the floor for the attendance if there is any question? I understand from the organizer that maybe a, a question is is coming from Ishai uh, Senshin. Is it is it is it true? Uh, can we give the floor to to Apichai? Uh, if you want to uh, raise uh, any point, no? Uh, I'll be shy, yes? Yeah, hi. Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Very well, and we are pleased to, to see and to hear you. Yeah, thank so you. you. You can uh, raise your point. Well, it's just a your comment. I think, yeah, I think uh, uh, you raised the issue uh, earlier on about Taiwan. So I was interested to hear from the panelists whether they have any views on Taiwan or how do you how to how to sort of uh, handle the issue, you know, uh, whether Taiwan is another Ukraine in the Far East or Pacific or not, or or, or will China not act the same like Russia? I don't know. Maybe a bit speculative, but I'd be good to know what kind of deterrence can we have on on this issue. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you indeed. Yes, Taiwan uh, remain uh, was remaining the elephant in the room during our discussion. This is clearly not a, a, a one minute answer for each of our panelists, but I think that we we have time, and this is a complex subject. Uh, and and I'm sure that uh, our aspect as a word of two uh, to to say about that. So. Can we go around again uh, through the order of speaking? So I'm coming back to you, Chilak. Okay, thank you, uh, Apichai, for the question on Taiwan. And when, when when I talk about, if I mention Indonesia and Taiwan, it is in, in fact quite a complicated relations in a way that um, traditionally Taiwan has been a strong trade and economic partner of Indonesia. But ever since the Belt and Road Initiative, ever since the turn of the 21st century, it's starting to be slightly undermined by, by China and Beijing. And that um, for, for a lot of Indonesians that are quite apolitical and may not be that interested in foreign policy, it's very easy for them to just swap between um, China and Taiwan. But uh, for me, if I can just personally say, there's one thing that is uh, can be utilized between both Jakarta and Taipei, is that is the fact that both uh, our states <laughs> or both government, the governments on, on, in both areas are democracies. And that is the main differences uh, between uh, you know, Taiwan and, and that of China. And it's something that I try to elaborate more, that I try to, to, to collaborate more with the, with, with, the, with the Taiwanese office here in Jakarta in a way that any cooperation that can be utilized between the two countries should not just be, you know, the pragmatic trade and economic uh, uh, dealings like in the past, but should further merit on the issue of democracies, on the issue of, you know, social liberty and et cetera. And that, because that is the main, the strongest um, asset and, and the main, uh, I suppose weaponry or asset of Taiwan that can be utilized and can be shared with us as well as how we can share our uh, uh, experience with democracy with them. And, and certainly this is something that possibly can be worked together for the both countries. Thank you. Thank you, Jilin. Uh, Vijay, do you want to, to, to uh, add something? I'm, I'm sure you had a view on the, the question. I, I think, you know, um, there is a, a tendency to uh, rather uh, kind of uh, assess that uh, what has happened uh, between Russia and Ukraine could be a similar mirror image we would find. It's very tempting, you know, to, to formulate. And I've been reading this for the last couple of months now, where in the sense that last couple of weeks rather, that it could be a, a kind of a model. But all in, this, in the same breath, uh, I also notice that um, it's too early to make a kind of a judgment of that kind because uh, we haven't had the good uh, assessment of what the fallout has been. I mean, some assessments suggest that 
um, so uh, Russia has been has had a setback lasting will be which will last it with it for next ten years or so. Can China afford it? So it is going to be a very carefully you know a careful approach by Beijing whether they want to really replicate that model. It is tempting. You know, it, it offers a lot of opportunity. Military would love it. They would have done the service that they are supposed to be doing to the nation uh, in, in the context of the Chinese, PLA. But there is a lot to be lost, a lot to be lost. And that China cannot afford to be put back by 10, 10 a decade or decade and now. It's very early. I, I'll, I'll not put my, I'll not stick my neck out and say, okay, this will happen or not. I'll stop at that. No, I do understand. It's really very difficult. And there is, as you mentioned, a temptation to make a, a, a transposition with the use of force on potential scenario of, of tension. And of course, there is uh, obviously a Taiwan who is uh, coming around for a very, very, very long time. Uh, Tom, what is your view about that? And, uh, and of course, I do understand that speaking all on this subject, you are not expressing the view of your national government. So, so feel free <laughs> if I... Um, okay, thank you. If I can uh, uh, allow you to... Okay. Uh, first one is that, as I described resilience, this is a key. And compare the Taiwan with the um, Ukraine. Taiwan is much more resilient in the leadership and uh, the minerals and network and support. That means Taiwan is much more resilient than the Ukraine case. That's number one. Number two is that the lesson of this, the Russian invasion with the Ukraine, the first one is that the Russian cost is huge. Second, resistance by the people is the great. Morale of the people is the, one of the, the deterrent vis-a-vis -vis the big neighboring country. And most critical one is that the cost imposing strategy vis-a-vis -vis Russia is slowly effective, uh, become more effective than expected. That means offensive capability cannot topple the determined government who are capable and resilient and support by the people. Last, not the least, is that Taiwan issue is the most critical kind of on the top agenda uh, between Tokyo and Washington DC. You will remember that the, our summit meeting mentioned a lot about the stability and the, and the situation of the Taiwan, uh, Taiwan Strait. And that means uh, we don't forget about this one. This is just being underlined. I'm not talking about the option line. I'm a strategist and academics. And uh, in that sense, I'm a cautious uh, optimist in that regard. I'll stop here. Oh, thank you for this uh, philosophical conclusion from uh, the cautious optimist. Very well, very well done. Uh, Francois Xavier, do you want to, to add any, any comment? Uh, Yes, uh, even if it is a very complicated uh, subject. But, Indeed. Uh, uh, the, the interesting thing is uh, I'm based in the Philippines, and the, uh, President Duterte a few uh, weeks ago uh, declared that uh, if uh, Ukraine, the war in Ukraine will escalate between Ukraine and, and, uh, and the, uh, Russia, uh, China will invade uh, Taiwan and the Philippines as a retaliation, in fact. Uh, uh, of course, we are in uh, in the election campaign actual actual election campaign. So, uh, uh, we, we, we uh, and at the same time, uh, uh, the president Duterte would like to develop even more relations with China. So he's trying to uh, uh, to, to fright, uh, frighten those who will be too much on the side of the United States. Uh, but but it's it's a real concern uh, in in Philippines. Uh, even though uh, personally, I don't think uh, that uh, the China will invade the Philippines, but uh, uh, in, in a longer term, maybe for, uh, for the case of Taiwan, it's a possibility. But for the Philippines, uh, that I, I don't... Uh... <laughs> Thank you, Francois Xavier. Uh, I, I think it's, uh, we are definitely running out of time. Uh, it's, it's my fault, I, 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 do, I do apologize, but I had so... Uh, 
I love uh, and, and, and sport money list that I, I want it really to challenge you and uh, for the pleasure of the audience, I'm, I'm sure. So I really warmly, warmly, deeply thank you for your passions, uh, for your insight. Uh, and um, I'm putting this panel at a close uh, and I give back the floor uh, to the organizer because maybe uh, you are going uh, to, to reshape the schedule uh, after that we have taken over 15 minutes, non-authorized 15 minutes, and uh, maybe uh, take over to the, to the supposed break uh, for uh, for the workshop again. Sorry for that. <laughs>